live. Hey, everybody. This is First Warren Storm Team Chief Meteorologist Brad Penovich here in Charlotte, North Carolina. We're trying something different tonight. We're bringing in some of my esteemed colleagues from across the southeast. So right now I'm in the upper left corner and up in the upper right is Tim Buckley from WFMY in Greensboro. Uh, bottom right, Jeff Lawson. He's the Chief Meteorologist up at WVC in Norfolk. And down in the bottom left, if I'm correct here, is Efren Afonte, right, from Columbia. So real quickly, guys, um, I kind of told everybody who you are, but uh, if you want to do a quick introduction and talk a little bit about how the storm is impacting Fast your region, close. because we're spread out from Columbia, Charlotte, Greensboro, uh, to Friday, Norfolk. So let's start to the south first. Uh, the first place impacted is going to be the Columbia market. So uh, Efren, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about what's going on down there. Well, right now, the biggest thing that we're watching is the actual track of Dorian. The key element that we're dealing with right now is our entire South Carolina coastline to the south around the Hilton Head area, what we call uh, the low country, all the way up to Merrill Beach, which is the Grand Strand. Closing at 5 p.m. Impact points we're looking at. Now, the Columbia metropolitan area, which is right in the heart of South Carolina, the biggest impacts we're going to be seeing, especially starting in the next few hours, is going to be the tropical storm force winds that's going to be affecting our eastern and southern communities. And of course, they're going to be impacted of whatever comes up the coastline. So the rainfall, that's going to be the other issue, as we've been seeing from the last two hurricanes that dropped a lot of rainfall from uh, Hurricane Harvey in Texas to Hurricane Closing Florence in Thursday, North and South Carolina. Friday, the biggest question we have right now is how much rain that we're gonna be getting pretty much in the southeastern half of South Carolina, because history dictates that when we have anything more than three to five inches of rain at the minimum, we start flooding issues. And the reason why they call it the low country is it's right on the coastline, it's pretty flat, but it's not a gradual incline as you go through South Carolina. A lot of our viewing area to the south and east of Columbia is still relatively flat and close to sea level. So the biggest issue, not so much is the storm surge, but the amount of rainfall that's gonna be coming down. Even if the rain isn't that much in our immediate Columbia metropolitan area, all the rain that's gonna happen right along the North and uh, South Carolina state line from the North Carolina Piedmont to the South Carolina PD will start flowing down into Central South Carolina, and the flooding issue is going to be the biggest risk, along with the tropical storm force winds. And right now, we're in a holding pattern because it hasn't started with the winds as of yet, but we're looking at right now, and it were in the next three to four hours for the winds to start picking up, and then eventually the rainfall as we get into the early morning hours tomorrow morning. Yeah. And uh, what about your current conditions? Like, are you guys abnormally dry? I mean, one of the things we've had with past storms is we've had kind of a precursor events that have kind of saturated everything. How are you guys in moderate drought or low end drought? Are you guys in a, a situation where the soil is already saturated? The problem is, is that we've had rainfall really this entire summer, few and far between. Just in our Columbia uh, City area alone for the year, we are almost seven inches deficit. And that is a significant amount. And considering the fact that we were almost in a similar situation back in 2015, around this time of the year, well, towards the end of September, the beginning of October, we had the historic 2015 flood. So when you're that dry, the ground really doesn't have enough time to absorb that much rain. I grant to the fact that when we had that historical flood, we had in many areas of our viewing area, over 20 inches of rainfall, it's just not enough time to absorb. So a lot of that just flash floods and that piles up, especially when you go closer to the coastline. So the biggest problem we have with the drought is we're gonna be seeing rainfall rates potentially in many areas of the Northeastern, Eastern and Southern portions of South Carolina. And of course, our viewing area in Columbia that three to five inches of rain, especially all within an hour or two is going to flood and there's no timetable of when that'll actually absorb. So this is going to be uh, not only a tropical wind event for South Carolina, but this is going to be a very likely flooding event. And Dorian's track is one thing that we're watching very carefully because no matter what category rate it's going to be, we know that the amount of rainfall that it's producing right now in the Atlantic is heading our way. 
Yeah, and just so everybody watching, uh, we just got the nine o'clock update um, and nothing's really changed except for, I think the big thing I've noticed, it's now due north movement at eight instead of that north, northwest. And I would argue it's been moving that way for a couple hours, but sometimes the hurricane center waits three hours of a movement to average out before they kind of do it. So that's key. It's now moving due north. It's not moving west at all. Um, now we're waiting for that northeast turn. But what's interesting tonight, and I'm going to bring in Tim Buckley, because not only does Tim work in Greensboro, but he worked in eastern North Carolina as well, uh, an area that's going to be heavily impacted by this and an area that we're covering. We've got crews out there as well in Atlanta Beach, uh, the Wilmington area and Charleston. But um, talk about, Tim, out there, because you have firsthand knowledge, storm surge potential out there is, is really high. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, here in the Piedmont, where I'm located in Greensboro, we're still kind of trying to figure out if we're going to get rain. We're going to yeah. be right on the edge of it, right? Just like Brad and Charlotte yeah. and like Columbia, South Carolina, too. We're on the edge. Um, but Wilmington, uh, and we've been trying to say this for a couple of days, People always focus on like that middle line of the cone. We actually yeah. took that out of our graphics because the cone is really trying to show people where the storm could make a direct hit. That's forecasting the center of the storm. It's still entirely possible that the Wilmington area, the Cape Fear region, as we call it there, really could see a landfall. It's possible. And the reason that North Carolina has a better chance of getting a landfall out of this than South Carolina or than other states really in general is we stick out like a sore thumb. We have the Cape yeah. Fear that juts out. We then have Cape Lookout, and then we have Cape Hatteras. So the Outer Banks, of course, are always at risk. And in this case, it's no different. It really is going to be riding the coast. Um, so to me, I have a couple concerns. I was also down there uh, reporting for us for Matthew, and Matthew was only a Category 1 at the time, but it had pushed so much water along the way. It was also one of the storms that was a Category 5 before. And it pushes a lot of water up the coast. I, I really think tomorrow, even tonight, you're going to see a lot of that water starting to come in um, from Myrtle Beach up to the Brunswick County beaches, uh, Wilmington area. You're going to get that surge ahead of the storm when the wind is still easterly. Um, so even if it doesn't make a direct hit, you're going to get a lot of that um, you know, flooding. We're forecasting a storm surge of 4 to 7 feet. That's a taller, taller than a lot of us. Um, so that's a big deal. Um, and then of course you have the inland flooding. Uh, Wilmington's been w dry this year, but uh, you know, they just went through Florence last year. So there are going to be a lot of issues in Southeast North Carolina. Uh, it, I've been telling folks it's either a bad storm if it doesn't make a direct hit or a really bad storm if it does make a direct hit. So just be ready. Yeah. And I think, you know, I want to stick on the surge theme because I thought you guys both brought up two good points, not focusing on the category and really focusing on that surge, which is going to happen way before the winds come up um, ahead of the storm. And I'll bring in Jeff now. Jeff is up in an area uh, probably in the most flood prone market that we're talking to tonight. Um, and you're probably thankful it's to yourself, but you guys cover a lot of the Outer Banks and you know that area, the Tidewater region down at the Outer Banks, very susceptible to storm surge. Uh, what are you guys worried about up there, Jeff? Well, it really depends, as you said. We don't cover most, we cover all the Outer Banks. We literally, our DMA is from Cape Hatteras all the way up to Chincoteague on the north. So, and on halfway to Richmond, Williamsburg wow. and stuff. So those areas are going to see minimal impact. The metro area, you know, Norfolk, Virginia Beach, Hampton, et cetera, they have their own set of issues. And then with that sharp cutoff, whether it's winds or whatever, the farther you go down the coast, the worse things are looking. We've got a couple of issues around here that we're concerned with. Flooding, obviously, and both tidal flooding and rainfall flooding. A lot of people are noticing the similarities with this storm to Matthew. And they're saying, oh my God, Matthew was horrible here. I mean, we had, so, we had areas that have literally never flooded, ever that flooded. And it wasn't from the storm surge. It was from Hurricane Hermine, which was a few weeks or whatever beforehand, gave us nine inches more rainfall the previous month than normal. So we had 14 inches of rain in a month. And then we added in a foot of rain three weeks later. So the places that had never seen anything of that, you know, magnitude ended up high, high, I'm talking high areas that are, you know, 12, 15 feet above um, sea level ended up with horrific flooding. And I don't know how many thousands and thousands of homes ended up having to redo their whole first floors. This one, you know, some of the models are having us up in that sort of a range of five to 10 inches. I've been pointing out and emphasizing that even if we get that, 
I don't think we'll have the kind of freshwater flooding that we had in terms of the issues with Matthew because we are only two inches above normal for the entire summer. Um, we're not super dry like uh, he was talking about down in Columbia, so we're going to be able to absorb some of it. So we're a little concerned with freshwater flooding, but not nearly to the extent we were heading into Matthew. Now, tidal flooding is another issue. Matthew did not bring us much tidal flooding. I think five point something, 5.3 feet, which for us is just barely into the moderate category of tidal flooding. With this storm down to our south, we're thinking obviously, you know, major tidal flooding, Cape Hatteras up to, you know, maybe Manio, et cetera, uh, where Roanoke Island is. From there up to the state line, maybe moderate to major flooding and then in Hampton Roads itself it'll depend partly on the wind direction and which inlets. We have some inlets where the Chesapeake Bay all gets funneled down into certain rivers and inlets and others are somewhat protected so we're worried about that and of course the winds. We're going to have winds that are 20 miles per hour at most in parts of our viewing area and then we'll have winds that'll gust to 100 in the southern part. Up here. Yeah, I think you've got a complex situation there where part of your viewing area is going to get probably hit pretty hard and one part is nothing. And I think from a communication standpoint, maybe you guys can all chime in on this is, you know, there's so many different threats spread across such a big geographic area. Um, how do you communicate this to people that some folks like Tim and I were, you know, in our viewing area, there's probably half of our viewing area that probably will have no idea there's a hurricane on the coast unless they were watching it on TV. And then the eastern part of our viewing area is going to have wind and maybe some possible flooding, depending on how these rain bands sets up. How have you guys been communicating this to your viewers, both on air and online? And uh, what have you found to be effective? Because I'm getting questions still that I think it's going to be another Hugo coming in the Western Carolinas. And you try to explain to people, no, this is really a, an Eastern Carolina event, but it's not like Matthew, but it's kind of like Matthew. It's kind of, it's been tough to communicate these threats. Tim, why don't you, what have you been trying? Well, I, I think it's always difficult um, just to kind of distill everything down to main threats, right? So uh, something Brad does a really good job about is a lot of times he'll color code things. Um, I think that's really helped. We show the computer models a lot. We show the spaghettis. They're memes now uh, today. Um, if you can just kind of boil things down to red, orange, and yellow, sometimes that actually makes things a little bit more simple. Um, I think that has worked to some degree. Uh, we've certainly been highlighting that the coast is at the biggest risk, but here inland, um, we care about the coast, so, so where people are interested. I think people are really taking it pretty seriously, though, um, because of how spooky and insanely strong it was in the Bahamas, and they saw that Cat 5 strength right away. Um, I do think people are taking it pretty seriously, um, but it is difficult to communicate just how sharp of a cutoff we're going to see, like we were talking about with the rainfall. So I've been trying to emphasize, hey, if we, we're either going to get no rain or we're probably going to get two inches. It's not going to be either or. It's just going to depend on how far inland those rain bands get because it's, it's you know, heavy rain, tropical rain. So I think the thing the folks at the coast have a much harder job because they have to try and get folks to take this seriously. And anyone who's lived through a hurricane before thinks they can do it again. And if, if there's, there's a bit of a badge of honor, right? If you survive a hurricane, you know, you kind of feel a little confident there. So I'll be very interested to see what the coastal Mets have to say about places like Wilmington um, and others. Are they taking it seriously or not? So that's just, yeah. I you am. know, what's interesting is we had a crew in Carteret County, which I think is one of the areas that might get hit the hardest. Um, and I was fascinated. We are, we had to evacuate hotels twice in that location. The, I think they're still really shocked from what happened with Florence last year, that they are being overly cautious in that area. They don't want to see anything yeah. like that. Um, but you're right. One of the things I always tell people is, you know, if, if you're smart, you probably can survive a storm, but why would you want to stay for the aftermath? Nobody thinks about the aftermath of having to live with no services, no electricity, no AC, no running water. Um, animals trying to crawl into your, I mean, I remember from Katrina, that was the thing I remember most is like a lot of people that made it didn't realize how miserable the conditions would be afterwards. So um, I think you just cut a leaf because nobody thinks about that aftermath. It is not a good time. Uh, what about you guys in Columbia? I mean, what has been the number one question you've gotten down in the Columbia area? When is this all going to stop? <laughs> I think we lost your mic there for a second.
All right, I can't hear you, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go. There we go. Try. Yeah. So Jeff, oh, there you go. Speak up a little bit. It sounds like it's really muted. Oh man, it was there for a second. <laughs> Jeff, what about you? We'll go. We'll come back to you. Hopefully, get that figured out. Um, Jeff, what's been the number one my like, question or concern that you've run into in your area? People want to know what it's comparable to. Absolutely. Whether it's wind, whether it's, you know, the rainfall, what's this, you know, going to compare to. So we did a nice graphic showing, you know, our flood of record is the 1933, you know, Cat 1 hurricane that hit us. The only one that's ever since, you know, 33, we've never had a direct hit here in Hampton Roads. We've had them hit the Outer Banks, come over us, but that's the record. Just under that is Isabel, 7.9 total feet above the lowest of the low tides. Um, so we compare it to people wanting, how's this compared to Isabel? You know, how's it compared to Irene? How's it compared to Matthew? Um, you know, some of these other ones. So we give them, like right now, we're giving them a range of six and a half to seven total feet of water in the basin above mean low or low water. And we're saying that's, you know, 10 to 17 inches below Matthew. People are like, oh, great. Well, I had, you know, a foot of water in my first floor during Matthew, so they can make a comparison. Um, in terms of like the wind damage and stuff, we say, you know, it, it might be like a Bonnie that we had if people, you know, for around here for that long. Or comparing it to Isabel, you know, we were, there were places, you mentioned being without power or water for a while. In Isabel, we had places for over a month that were many, many places over a month that never had electricity. Um, and people for a year or two that were living in trailers in some of our locations. So people, you know, want to know how it's going to compare to that. And we'll tell them, you know, maybe in terms of the wind speeds, it might be similar, but there are, again, some major differences. With Isabel, we were extremely saturated. I don't know, we lost tens and tens and tens of thousands of trees. We're not going to lose that many in this situation. So that's been the biggest thing is trying to sort of compare for people. And then the people that don't, we use the explainers to try to show what we're talking about. Yeah, that's great. All right, I think we got your mic fixed, Efren. So uh, tell us what your what your biggest concern from viewers in your area has been. <laughs> we had it fixed. Oh no. So it doesn't seem to be working again. But I'll tell you, I'm getting some. I'm looking at the chat. So we're getting, um, you know, we're on Periscope, Facebook, YouTube. I'm getting a lot of questions uh, from Western Carolinas um, about impacts in the Charlotte area. I can tell you in the Charlotte area. I don't see a lot of big impacts and maybe Tim can chime in on this. Um, I think that I, I would say from 85 West, there might be little to no impact um, in our area, but East of 77 towards uh, the Sand Hills. I think the Sand Hill communities up in that area, central North Carolina is the one area I have huge question marks about Tim. If mm. we get a heavy rain band to set up there, there could be a ton of rain or no rain. <laughs> yeah, I'm also interested, maybe you are too, about how big does the wind field spread out? Yeah, does it spread have, out? Because yeah. you have this front, I mean, it's not a super strong front, but you do have a front that's kind of digging in at the same time. We saw that with Matthew and and it really, you know, the wind field will spread out some. So I'm, I'm curious to see how high the wind gusts get. There are a couple of the models that we look at out there that are a little aggressive uh, from time to time. So that might be a question I have um, just, you know, how far east or how far west does the wind get? And my biggest question still is just, I don't know how far inland the rain is going to get. Um, I have a general idea. I think, you know, 220 for us, I-73 for others is probably a good dividing line. I've been telling folks, if you live west of Greensboro, don't plan on a drop. If you live in Raleigh, you probably get three to four inches. And there's a gradient in between that includes Burlington and Siler City and you name it. But it's going to yeah. be a big spread. Right. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. I mean, you brought up the dry air on the west side. So I brought up the, the water vapor loop here. I mean, that's a lot of dry air. And I think that's why the questions on the west side become really interesting. I think we lost Tim. Um, but the dry air on the west side and, and Jeff, maybe you could talk about this because there's a trough coming down in the front. And I think particularly up in your area, one thing that'll be interesting is the interaction with that trough could that expand the wind field way up into your area? Absolutely. And that's another comparison with Matthew. You know, I've been here for 
30 years now and doing weather in Southeast Virginia on TV for 36. So I've seen a million of these storms come and go. And you've got, you know, they're all different, but in some respects, there's a similarity between a lot of them where the east side gets, as you would expect, out over the water, no friction. That has all the serious winds. And then you get back over land and we can have a Hurricane Gloria, which was a monster of a storm, come 20 miles from our coastline and not bring any. There wasn't a drop of rain here because that west side got eroded away so much with the dry air entrainment like you're talking. So we have a history of that. And that was why when Matthew was coming, our big question was, okay, is Matthew going to do the same? Well, it did the opposite because it was transitioning to, you know, more of an extra tropical storm or a hybrid. It turned into more of a nor'easter. And instead of having the heaviest winds right around the center, all of a sudden, like in a nor'easter, they're out closer to halfway between the high and the low and you get, you know, that forcing zone. And so some of the strongest winds in our area with Matthew were over our metro area and not over the southern outer banks. So that's something we're really, we've been concerned with and that we've sort of gone back and forth with is how much of that will we get in terms of the expanding wind field. But absolutely, that's why we're going a little higher um, if you look at, you guys had the cone with the 39, you know, knot winds and the uh, hurricane force winds coming up. And those for much of our area, we're not even, we're barely in that 39, you know, mile per hour cone. Yet we're calling for a lot of areas to have gusts, you know, in the 50s or even up near 60. So we think the odds are, are higher than are be depicted there. The chance of 40 plus is what, 40? Does that say? Yeah, over the heart of my area, it's pretty much 40%. I would say it's higher than that. So we're going, you know, 10 miles per hour, at least more than some of the uh, guidance is going. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm interested in that too, because even when Michael came up here, we had a little sting jet formed on the backside as it was coming extra tropical. And we had stronger winds with Michael passing over us than Florence, which actually passed quicker over us. So it's kind of a initially step. So we're getting a lot of questions at the coast and maybe all of us can chime in on this, but a lot of questions about specific beaches. I heard Topsail Highland, Ocean Isle, Moorhead City. Um, a lot of folks obviously have vacation properties at the beach. Um, let, let, me, let me just open this up for anybody. What do you guys honestly think is going to be the biggest impacted area in North, South, North or South Carolina or Virginia? Um, because if I had to ask me, I really think it's going to be the Outer Banks and that Carteret County, the southern part of Pamlico Sound and possibly the Wilmington area, as Tim was talking about, if it clips that area. What do you guys think? I'm, I completely agree. Uh, I honestly, my, the largest impact that I'm looking at right now, at least within the next um, 24 hours, is as far as South Carolina, if this continues Dorian's path, regardless of landfall or not, the two largest things we're going to be looking at, at least in the Myrtle Beach Grand Strand area, heading towards um, uh, Arizona, uh, we could be looking at uh, on the short end, uh, we have a South Santee River that runs uh, just south of Myrtle Beach. Uh, inundation models are indicating possibly up to nine feet storm surge. Uh, the amount of rainfall that a lot of models are indicating in the area of the Grand Strand and Preston, South Carolina, we call it the PD, um, that runs right along the North and South Carolina uh, state line and in Eastern South Carolina, some models are indicating that not only are they going to be dealing with the rainfall of 10, maybe 11 inches, but the tropical, the hurricane force winds also seen between 50 and 70 miles an hour. So you've got three threats right now in, in that area of not only extreme eastern South Carolina, but of course uh, the areas of uh, south central and southeastern North Carolina in, in Tim's area. One area I'm concerned with is the sound side flooding for us. You know, the, all this water comes into the uh, Pamlico and the Albemarle sounds, and then the storm moves offshore and you get that switch to northwesterly. And man, do we get places like, you know, Roanoke Island and Manio and anywhere along the Outer Banks, but on the west side, absolutely is under feet and feet of water when we get some of these storms like this. So 
some people, especially new to the area, don't tend to think about that because they think of the northeast wind and all that. So we are particularly concerned about some serious, serious sound side flooding for the Outer Banks. Yeah, you know, looking, I was looking at some of the guidance, you know, some of the model, I'm sure you guys look at some of the storm surge modeling and that, and I, Jeff, I agree. I, some of the sound side flooding with it just offshore look, was really off the charts, like in the Havelock area um, down there that was really hit by um, areas uh, of Florence were hit with a ton of flooding there. It, it sound side flooding, it's easy to move that shallower water on the sound side than it is over on the ocean side. Sometimes it just takes that quick shift. So a lot of questions, um, about specific locations, which is pretty common. But one of the things you get a lot of questions about is, you know, how do people survive on the Outer Banks? <laughs> I get this a lot because you know there's always somebody who stays out there. Um, and Jeff, you're really familiar with this area, but oh, yeah. there's a lot of diehards that aren't gonna leave. Well, how, how do they deal with it out there? My sister-in-law and brother-in-law live there on the Outer Banks. They have never once evacuated and they've lived through all the storms and it's funny some of the storms you would think would be the worst they're like oh you know that wasn't all that bad and then i can't remember what storm it was probably two three year four years ago she's like i really wish i would have left this was the worst storm we've ever gone through now they're lucky because they're up at 12 or 50 12 or something feet above sea level so they don't have to worry about it just the winds they don't have to worry about the flooding issues i don't know how the people put up with it and go through it that are in some of the areas around hatteras that you know oh. it just i don't know <laughs> yeah and highway 12 gets rebuilt yeah. it seems like every six months uh, yeah, <laughs> somebody pours a coke or a slushy out the window on the way <laughs> home from 7-eleven and you get overwash on route 12 yeah I mean, it's, it is it is barrier islands, and they're, they are kind of susceptible to that. Um, you know, before, we're almost out of time here, guys. I don't want to keep everyone too long, but, you know, we're going to get a forecast update at 11. So let's do a quick around the horn. What do you guys expect to surprise you? And what do you think, um, as far as the, 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 the biggest struggle with forecasting a storm has been for you? Yeah, um, I'm kind of surprised just – you know, we had such such a sharp turn off of Florida, obviously. I think that's kind of mystified the whole nation. Everyone's amazed that a storm could sit just like that, right? They said, Tim, oh, Tim, I think that's a, that's a very good point because we were talking about that today. Right. Imagine the people down in Miami. That thing was like 150 miles east of them, and they weren't right. under any tropical products. That's science. I mean, that's like, that's modern day of us being able to say, no, no, it's really not going to hit you. And that should be applauded and amazing that they didn't have to evacuate, really. Uh, and it would have been so different 10 or 20 years ago, right? Yeah, they would have no idea. It could have been off the coast of Africa. We wouldn't have known about it until it was hitting somebody. Um, Tim, what do you think, what do you expect to see tonight? Anything that is going to surprise you going forward? Um, I mean, I've, I've been kind of amazed at how consistent the track has been. I actually posted earlier today, I said, you know, anyone in the Carolinas should not be surprised because the cone has been the same since Sunday. Um, if you look at the cone, yes, there's been slight shifts west, east, if you look at the center line, but don't do that. The cone has been the same for the most part for several days. So I actually expect them to kind of keep it the same. Um, I think the Outer Banks remains at the biggest risk of a direct landfall, followed by Cape Lookout and, you know, Cape Fear in the Wilmington area. And um, I think I think it's going to move along as expected. Oh, we'll see if they increase it to a Cat Three, right? It's only one mile per hour off, but I, I don't much care about that. I know a lot of other people do. Uh, the impact should stay the same. Yeah. What about Efren? What do you think? I think the biggest thing that would surprise me is if it actually increases its forward motion and turns a little bit earlier. But the guidance models, the spaghetti models, and the National Hurricane Center's cone. Uh, has been relatively consistent over the last 24 hours. Uh, the, the big concern now is when is it going to make it turn now that it's moving north at eight miles an hour? If it slows down or, or doesn't speed up at all where it is now or it turns later, regardless of whether it makes landfall anywhere along the South Carolina coastline or uh, the South Carolina banks, uh, I would be very surprised if it doesn't drop as much rain as a lot of the models are forecast. Um, I, I still do expect that it's going to be slower than what's been anticipated, regardless of when it turns. Uh, but I would be very surprised both if it speeds up and it doesn't drop as much rainfall as it's expecting. Yeah. Jeff, what about you? I mean, what, is, what has been 
the biggest challenge and, and what do you think is going to happen coming up uh, tonight at 11? The biggest challenge for us has been figuring out if the storm's going to be where, you know, you guys talk about it being a relatively tight window. And it is when you consider still, you know, a ways away. But for us, the difference between 30 miles east of Hatteras and 30 miles northwest of Hatteras is pretty significant. I mean, really significant. Uh, if it follows the H war for the H Mon, you know, one of those has it coming up almost over the state line, North Carolina and Virginia, not within 10, 10 or 15 miles of that. You know, that's what I'll be watching for. I don't think it's going to do that. If pe people have been following along, amateur, you know, meteorologists at home looking at a lot of people do that now, go to the model pages, whatever. Those have been by far the farthest left with the storm the entire time. So the history of that is telling me that they're probably the outliers. And I'm hoping that continues to be the case. But that's something we'll probably watch most, most, most carefully. And Brad, if I can just add to what Jeff's been saying and what Tim alluded to earlier, a lot of people get focused on that center red line. And the way this hurricane is moving, the second Jeff said, just a deviation either to one side or another by as little as 25 to 30 miles would be the difference of a far larger impact exponentially versus virtually nothing at all. And that's a very important thing that a lot of our viewers um, in, in all of our uh, viewing areas need to really understand that don't concentrate on that red line. You know, it can change in one hour and that red line can shift either for the better or for the worse. And what I'd like to add to that one thing, we've not only been emphasizing that, that's a great point, but the fact that only two thirds of the time does the center even stay within the cone historically? <laughs> you know, I've been pointing that out to people and I'm like, well, not, you know, what if it's a way over here? There's not only a small chance of that, there's a decent chance. So, you know, both those points are just so valuable for people to understand. And yeah, I've been thinking. Okay. I've been thinking about the cone a lot lately, and I've I've seen some research papers on on ways to depict it better. And I think that that's the one thing I could change going forward is come up with a better way to talk about the track because yeah. um, it's kind of like chance of rain. Everybody has their own definition of it. Everybody can <laughs> see it, but not everybody is communicating it the same way and understanding it. So it's it's something we'll work for. And as people watching, one of the things I know we all struggle with. The science of meteorology is pretty amazing. We're really good at it. One of the things that's most difficult for us now is communicating the science to people. And that's something we all try to work hard on every day. And that's why we do, um, you know, events like this streaming to try to explain things as best as possible. Now, I'm going to let these guys go because we've all got a lot of work tonight. We've got shows coming up and uh, covering a lot of people. Thanks for joining us tonight, everybody. And make sure you're following all these guys online on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Go to their websites. They, they, I like local knowledge. Everyone asks me things, but please go to your local meteorologist. They know the area the best. They can give you the best information. So if you're in an area, try to find a local meteorologist that can give you local personalized information and, and try to steer clear of those national apps. They don't do very good with these events. <laughs> Take care, everybody. All right, see ya.